Hello YouTube, today we're going to continue our uh, discussion of race. Um, we're looking at some of the arguments that have been proposed uh, against uh, the idea that race is a biologically real. Uh, so let's get right to it. So uh, a fourth argument, um, probably the most famous argument against racial naturalism, comes from a, a 1972 paper by Richard Lewontin. Lewontin analysed genetic variation worldwide and he found that 85.4% of genetic variation exists within single populations, uh, where a population is defined as a national or linguistic group. So in other words, if you were to kill all of the humans except, for example, the Kung Bushmen of the Kalahari Desert, 85% uh, of genetic variation would survive. The majority of the you know, the, the genes that are found around the world would survive. Very few uh, genes are exclusive to any one part of the world. Of the remaining 15% of genetic variation, 8.3 was found between populations uh, within the classically defined races. So, for example, uh, between the uh, British and the, uh, and the French or the you know, Nigerians and the Somalians. Uh, only 6.3% of genetic variation uh, distinguished the traditional continental races. Basically, there is over 10 times more genetic variation within races than between races. Further studies have uh, confirmed Lewontin's results in a study by Noah Rosenberg and colleagues uh, in uh, their paper Genetic Structure of Human Populations. They estimate, they estimate that 93 to 95% of genetic variation exists within populations. Uh, so uh, that seems like a pretty powerful argument uh, and many uh, people, as I say, have found this to be pretty much decisive. However, it does face some important objections. First of all, um, and I guess perhaps rather obviously, uh, you have to bear in mind that minor genetic variation can lead to significant phenotypic differences. Chihuahuas and golden retrievers, for example, are almost identical genetically, but they're also clearly different, both physically and in terms of their intelligence and personality. So the mere fact that there is little genetic variation between races doesn't necessarily mean that there aren't significant differences. So what might Lewontin say to this? Well, I think one crucial point is that Lewontin focuses on the... Uh, on the difference of the amount of genetic variation within races versus the amount of genetic variation between races. His point is not so much that the amount of genetic variation between races is small, but that the amount of genetic variation within races is so much greater. So, prima facie, we shouldn't expect the phenotypic differences between races to be much greater than the phenotypic differences we find within races. Uh, now, of course, the racial naturalist can always object that genetic variation doesn't necessarily neatly map onto phenotypic variation. It could be that the relatively minor between-race genetic variation uh, leads to significant phenotypic differences, whereas the relatively large within-race genetic variation doesn't have much of an impact on the phenotype. But of course that's something that would um, need to be established empirically and um, you know, as far as I know no racial naturalists have done that kind of empirical work yet. So I think perhaps then the point of Lewontin's argument is maybe just to shift the burden of proof. Given the fact that between-race genetic variation is so small relative to within-race genetic variation, we should expect that there will not be substantial differences between races. Um, I mean, sure, maybe the between-race genetic variation does lead to substantial uh, differences between races, but... Uh, right now, there's not really any reason to believe that it does. So, um, so the argument still perhaps stands. However, a second uh, important objection proposed by A.W.F. Edwards is that Lewontin commits a uh, rather simple statistical fallacy, which Edwards dubs Lewontin's fallacy. So, uh, Lewontin performed... Um, what's known as a single locus analysis on 17 different loci. A locus is basically the position of a gene on a chromosome. Uh, it's, it's, the, it's the place where a particular gene is found on a chromosome. So you can think of a locus as uh, an address for a, for a given a gene. So a single locus analysis uh, 
takes a particular locus and it looks for variations at that locus. It looks for different alleles of the same gene at that locus and then tracks the variations. This is what Lewontin did. You can examine the variation within one position of a gene on a chromosome. And he, he did that for various different, uh, for 17 different uh, loci. Now, Edward's objection is that this method ignores the correlations in the variations at different loci. So here's an intuitive illustration from Adam Hockman. Uh, consider some fictional data about maize and wheat yields. Suppose we graph the weight of maize and wheat yields in tons per hectare. The black squares represent the maize, the gray diamonds represent the wheat. As you can see, they largely overlap. Next, consider the amount of rainfall that maize and wheat yields received during the growing season. Well, here we have even more overlap. Now notice that on the basis of this data, we wouldn't really be able to distinguish the maize from the wheat. Um, you know, if you if you sort of had if you didn't know whether it, so if if you had like a, a point on either of these graphs and you didn't know whether it was maize or wheat, then you you probably wouldn't be able to determine which it was. You know, there might be a point here and then a point here, and you know, who knows? You wouldn't be able to know which it was. You wouldn't be able to sort it. Uh, we can see that the variation within maize or wheat in each case is greater than the variation between them just as was the case with Lewontin's data on race. But now, let's say we correlate the data for the weight of the yield and the amount of rainfall. Well, we can see that now the maize and the wheat form separate clusters. In fact, there's no overlap whatsoever. Now, of course, this is rather unrealistic. There would be some overlap, but you can see the point, right? Examining just the variation in uh, the, the weight of the yield or the variation in the amount of rainfall ignores the correlation structure. Now the racial naturalist suggests that races can similarly be clustered by analyzing correlation data. Um, but the, the problem with Lewontin's argument is that it just, it just ignores this. It just ignores any potential correlation data. Uh, and a, a little bit later we'll look at a study that does uh, use correlation data, but the point is that Lewontin's argument um, just ignores this, and so it doesn't really tell us anything about race. So can Lewontin respond? Well, one point which is raised by Jonathan Marks is that the point of race is to refer to groups of people that are homogenous within the group and heterogeneous between groups. That's what the concept of race requires. The people within a race need to be largely the same and they need to be largely different from people of other races. Lewontin's results do show that there are no such groups, even if you perform this correlation analysis. Uh, so the, the mere fact that we can divide humanity into particular groups doesn't entail that those groups are races. Of course, the problem with this kind of response is that it's arguably a bit of a straw man. Um, sophisticated racial naturalists these days presumably wouldn't accept such a strong notion of race. So I think perhaps a better response uh, has been made by Adam Hockman. Hockman grants that Lewontin's analysis ignores the correlation structure, but he thinks that this is uh, just irrelevant to the question of race. Uh, the, 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 the problem, according to Hockman, is that this kind of uh, correlation analysis is not used in biological classification in general. We don't distinguish subspecies of other animals by applying this kind of analysis. Instead, we would use the single locus analysis used by Lewontin. Or actually, I mean, more, more commonly, I think we would just um, you know, look at the uh, phenotype of the organisms and sort them that way, or you'd look at the ancestry and descent and so on. Um, but the point is you don't use this kind of correlation uh, analysis. So basically, uh, according to Hockman, the racial naturalist is trying to apply to humans a completely different standard to what we use for all other species. And that's unacceptable. Um, so, so, I mean, basically, Hockman leaves the racial naturalist with a dilemma. Either we need to reform biological taxonomy in general and start using correlation analysis to distinguish uh, subspecies in other animals, or races, um, the, the sort of races as defined by correlation analysis, are actually not biologically significant. Hockman, of course, thinks that there is uh, no good reason to reform current uh, 
biological taxonomic practice. So we should say that this kind of correlation analysis is irrelevant to classification. So I think this is a pretty uh, interesting point, but uh, the racial naturalist does have, I think, a rather plausible response. Classifying humans doesn't necessarily have to be the same as other kinds of biological classifications. Um, if correlation analysis shows that we can group human populations together along the lines of traditional races, well, it looks like we have found a biological difference between the traditional races. And isn't that really, I mean, isn't that all it means to say that races are biologically real? I mean, Hoffman's worry is, well, you know, does, does this count as a uh, legitimate basis for biological classification? But I'm not sure that's such an important question, because biological taxonomy has many, you know, there are different goals, there are different ways to approach it, right? So um, very often uh, subspecies uh, are distinguished on the basis of very, very minor differences. We might distinguish two subspecies of insects uh, simply on the basis of I don't know, the number of spots on their back, for example. And the one motivation here for distinguishing subspecies is a concern for protecting particular ecosystems. If you can get a population of organisms listed as a different subspecies or a different species, then they're more open to protection by things like the Endangered Species Act. So let's say a company wants to clear cut a particular region of rainforest. Well, one way to stop this is to show that this region contains endangered species unique to that area. So what you do is you find some population of, I don't know, let's say clouded yellow butterflies. And this population is slightly different from other clouded yellow butterflies. Well, then you just designate it a different species. And because they're only, they're sort of only unique to that particular area, then you can no longer clear cut the forest. The, my, the point of this example is that there aren't fixed facts about how much difference or what kind of difference is required to uh, give us two populations in, is required to give two populations a different biological classification. So, I mean, I, I think the question of whether race is biologically real uh, it can't be answered by appealing to whatever the standard practices might be in biological taxonomy. Um, it, it would seem, you know, if this correlation analysis shows that uh, that there are differences or that races cluster genetically in different ways, then that would seem to be a biological difference and uh, that would seem to be all that is required for the racial naturalist. Uh, so that's, so that's maybe uh, a problem with Hockman's response here. Another point raised by Hockman, though, is, um, well, suppose that Lewontin's analysis had found substantial differences. Would anyone say that this is not relevant to racial classification? Would the racial naturalists have accused him of a fallacy in this case? Well, probably not. So Hockman worries that there's a double standard. Uh, if the single locus analysis had revealed uh, substantial differences, racial naturalists would have been happy to appeal to that to support the biological reality of race. But because it didn't reveal such differences, racial naturalists claim it's irrelevant. Um, and so there's, Hockman worries that there's perhaps, uh, as I say, a bit of a double standard in their um, attitude here. Right, a final argument against racial naturalism appeals to the discordance uh, in the uh, patterns of variation of different traits. And this is a point which I mentioned in the last video. So here's a map of the distribution of uh, skin colour in indigenous populations. And we can compare this to a map of uh, the distribution of blood types of the A allele, of the blood type A. Uh, as you can see, there is no significant overlap. The maps are completely discordant. Uh, so this objection claims that other traits will exhibit similar discordance. Although there are some phenotypic traits that are correlated, the more traits we consider, the less overlap we'll find. So basically this objection claims that uh, dividing humanity up on the basis of skin colour is arbitrary. It's just as reasonable to divide us up on the basis of blood type, but then if, that would of course give us a system completely at odds with uh, the traditional racial classifications. This discordance arises because different traits are subject to different evolutionary pressures. Uh, so the distribution of skin colour uh, 
is a result of differences in exposure to the sun. In warmer climates with a lot of sun exposure, uh, melanin, which gives skin its darker pigment, helps to protect skin against damage from ultraviolet rays. However, since melanin acts as a sunscreen, it reduces the production of vitamin D. People with darker skin are therefore at greater risk of vitamin D deficiency. So in the temperate zones where the sun is weaker and hence there's less danger of UV damage, and it's harder to synthesize vitamin D, high melanin content becomes maladaptive. When humans left Africa, they were under selective pressure for paler skin. On the other hand, consider sickle cell anemia. Traditionally, sickle cell anemia was considered a black disease because it was primarily seen in black people. But in fact, this is highly misleading. Sickle cell anemia follows patterns of malaria distribution. Uh, skin colour is completely incidental. Uh, people who are uh, heterozygous for an abnormal allele of the haemoglobin beta gene, um, so heterozygous means they have one abnormal allele and one normal allele, these people are slightly anemic, but uh, not to an extent that is debilitating, but they're also resistant to mal malaria. So in places with a high incidence of malaria, these people do the best and their genes spread. Unfortunately, people who are homozygous for the abnormal allele, so both alleles are abnormal, uh, they have sickle cell anemia, which is a, a serious blood disorder. That disease is a byproduct of selection for, the, uh, for people who are heterozygous for the abnormal allele. But you can see that in that case, uh, you know, as I say, skin colour is just incidental to that. It's just a matter of uh, areas where there is malaria. Uh, finally, in some cases, there is uh, little selective pressure, which means that the distribution of a trait is a result of uh, genetic drift. Uh, we've already noted the example of Huntington's disease among the Afrikaners. Genetic drift also appears to account for the distribution of blood types. Uh, type O blood approaches 100% among those native to South America, and that's likely just because the people who first migrated to that continent happened to have a higher frequency of the O allele. Uh, another example um, that probably resulted from drift are the BRCA mutations. Women who have certain variants of the BRCA gene are vastly more likely to develop breast cancer. It, it raises the probability of developing breast cancer uh, to about 60%. Uh, this mutation is much more common among Ashkenazi Jews uh, Hispanics and African American women. So again, um, that, that seems to be a result of drift. Uh, in the last video, I mentioned the example of the heart failure drug Bidil, which the FDA approved for use specifically among African Americans. Does Bidil show that races are real? Well, hopefully the discussion so far should lead you to be a little bit more sceptical. First of all, even if it's true that Baidu works uh, best among black people, but not so well among white people, this doesn't necessarily establish race, because this is just one medication responding to just one physical trait. Uh, other traits might be uh, have a completely discordant uh, pattern of variation. Uh, second, recall that the purported reason Bidal works among black people is that they have lower levels of nitric oxide, and Bidal works best when, uh, among, when levels of nitric oxide are lower. But, I mean, again, this might be a rather misleading way of phrasing it. It may well be the case that only some black people have lower levels of nitric oxide, and that actually this, uh, this sort of tracks a more specific kind of ancestry just as is the case with sickle cell anemia, right? Sickle cell anemia isn't a black disease, it's a disease related to malaria incidents. So it, it depends on whether your ancestors are from somewhere with a high uh, rate of malaria. Perhaps something similar is the case for these lower levels of nitric oxide. Indeed, we do know, actually, that many black people don't respond to Bidil, and many white people do respond to it. So we have to be careful with uh, race-based medicine like that. <clears throat> Now, the primary objection to uh, this uh, appeal to the discordance in patterns of variation uh, is that this essentially makes the same mistake as Lewontin's argument. Recall that the point raised by Edwards in response to uh, Lewontin is uh, that Lewontin performs a single locus analysis, and Edwards, Edwards says we have to consider the correlation structure of various, uh, of various loci. So similarly, although it might seem at first as though traits are simply discordant. If we consider many traits and we look at the correlations among them, then actually we're able to form fairly clear groups.
An example of this is a study I mentioned previously by Noah Rosenberg and colleagues uh, in the paper Genetic Structure of Human Populations. Rosenberg studied 377 DNA sequences from over 1,000 individuals from 52 populations around the world. They used a computer program called Structure, uh, which looks for similarities and differences in sets of data and can divide the data into subsets. Now, when given uh, genetic data, unlike a single locus analysis, this looks for correlations, just as Edwards uh, would suggest. Uh, and when asked to divide the data into five subsets, Structure clustered the samples from uh, Africa, Europe, Asia, uh, Oceania and America. So here's uh, an image of the result. Uh, African DNA is in orange, European DNA in blue, East Asian DNA in pink, Australasian in green, and American in purple, uh, Native American in purple. This seems to correspond to the traditional uh, big five races. Uh, basically, uh, if, you, if you have European ancestry, then structure will almost always place you in the European set. If you have a Native American ancestry, you will almost always be placed in the Native American set, and so on. So this seems to be an objective classification system, and it matches the traditional races to a large extent. Uh, there are some uh, divergences. Um, so uh, the cluster centering on Europe includes Middle Eastern and Central and South Asian populations. Uh, I mean, tr in traditional racial classifications, um, people might put Europeans as being substantially different from those. But broadly speaking, we have large populations here split according to the major geographical regions. Now, one uh, response to the Rosenberg study, uh, given by Lynn Jord and Stephen Wooding, uh, in their article, Genetic Variation, Classification and Race, uh, is, uh, well, essentially their suggestion is that the problem with the Rosenberg study is that they used primarily native populations from widely separated areas. And the point is that by selecting the right populations, you can sort of bias the program to divide those populations in such a way as to give neat clusters of the traditional races. Uh, so Jordan Wooding first ran the structure program on DNA from native populations of Africans, East Asians and Europeans. And here's the results, as you can see from this image, it clusters them very tightly. If you were a member of one of these populations and you gave your DNA to the to the, the, the program, you had it analysed, it would be able to tell you with pretty much 100% uh, accuracy which population you're a member of. However, in a second study, Jordan Wooding added a sample of South Indians who occupy a, a, an intermediate geographical position. And in this case, there is substantial overlap with the East Asian and European peoples. Um, so, you know, what, what race do they belong to? Uh, they don't seem to belong to any particular race. So that's perhaps one problem. Uh, a second, I think, perhaps more powerful response uh, to using the Rosenberg data to defend racial naturalism is that the structure program making the analysis must be told in advance how many groups it is to find. So it's not that you give the program the genetic data and then it just spits out these five races. Instead, you have to say, OK, give me five groups. But you can ask it to give you any number. Uh, so if you ask it to divide humans into two groups, you get clusters uh, centering in Africa and America, uh, as shown in this first image here. So in, in this case, European populations get classed as African, while Australasian and Asian populations get classed as American. If you ask it for three groups, the European populations split off. Ask for four groups and the East Asians split off. Ask for five and you get uh, 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 the Australasians split from the East Asians, giving the result we, uh, we just mentioned earlier. If you ask for six groups, the clash people split off. This is a, a small uh, isolated population from Pakistan and um, as I say they're, they're shown in, in yellow here. So uh, in this case of six uh, the clusters are no longer associated with major geographical regions. Uh, Rosenberg's own work uh, permitted clusters from two to twenty. Uh, 
um, but you could you could do more with you know uh, you, you could have any number of clusters so the question is what determines the fineness of grain right what determines the number of clusters that we specify should we tell the program to give us two clusters giving very coarse grained races or should we ask it to give us 50 clusters which would give us very fine grained races well, of course we're inclined to say five clusters but that's only because the five clusters happen to be somewhat close to the traditional racial categories from a purely biological point of view any number of clusters is just as significant as any other indeed we can actually show statistically significant genetic differences between almost any two geographical populations say people in Cornwall and people in Devon uh, those are two counties in England so choose any populations you like and you'll find some way to differentiate them di genetically uh, so from a genetic point of view it seems that there's no more reason to call Africans and Europeans races than for instance Ethiopians and the English or New Yorkers and Berliners. Now obviously if we're willing to call New Yorkers and Berliners races I think it's pretty clear that the term race has lost any substantial meaning. Um, in that case we would just be using the term race to mean something like population. Obviously nobody, nobody denies that there are human populations and there are differences between human populations. Uh, that's a, a, a trivial claim. So, uh, those are the main arguments against uh, racial naturalism and some potential responses. There's a lot more to be said uh, on this, but uh, that should give you some sense of how the debate goes. Now, before finishing, um, there are a couple of, uh, well, just points I think we can make in conclusion. First of all, whatever our view of race, uh, I think that the arguments we've seen do show that the traditional folk categories of race and traditional attitudes about race are misleading or at least or, or possibly incorrect um, races are not fixed and the distinctions between them are not huge um, furthermore as the Rosenberg study showed uh, you know if you, if you want to say that there are five clusters you're going to have to group Middle Easterns and some Asians with Europeans and so on um, so you know many of the traditional attitudes uh, are not empirically supported second um, there are, I think, certain dangers in treating race as a biological reality. This is, you know, I mean, certainly we might say that race is biologically real, but we have to be careful. And we can see this with the uh, development of race-based medicine like the Bidil drug. One very important thing to bear in mind is that even if there is some genetic physiological difference between races that is relevant to, for example, heart failure and that would support different treatment programs, it's also pretty obvious that another major factor is social. Um, so discrimination against African Americans is likely to lead to different health outcomes. If African Americans face discrimination, well that will probably lead to reduced opportunities, it may lead to them being poorer, having less access to good medical care, um, less access to good food and so on. Now obviously your diet and your general lifestyle can all affect how particular drugs work. So the worry about race-based medicine is that health disparities which are brought about by social and economic inequalities may become tied to, you know, to particular races. They may become sort of viewed as being rooted in genetics. And this means that they will end up becoming viewed as, in some sense, inevitable rather than something that can be alleviated with social changes. So that rather than dealing with the disparities through uh, you know, state intervention to stop discrimination, which would presumably be the right approach, it's instead targeted by medicine. Um, so, I mean, the point is that whatever our view of race, uh, care must be taken in applying it uh, scientifically. Right, uh, that is the end of, of that. I hope you found that uh, interesting. Um, and, uh, well, yeah, that's, that's it for, for race. Thanks for watching.